And then Hamlet enters and proceeds to speak the most famous lines in English literature. Okay, forget about that part for a second. Let's just look at the words. Remember where Hamlet was last time we saw him? He was psyching himself up because he knew that tomorrow night he was going to test Claudius. And then if he fails that test, Hamlet says, I know my course, presumably to kill him. And that's the guy who enters to do to be or not to be. Almost every time I've seen this performed, in movies, on stage, you name it, Hamlet enters with a weapon, usually pointed at himself in some way. I've seen him with a dagger pointed at his heart or his throat. I've seen him with a noose around his neck. I've seen him with a bottle of pills to OD on. But we're going to go word by word through this speech. And at the end, you tell me if this sounds like a guy with a gun to his head. And he doesn't see Ophelia. He just starts in and he says, to be or not to be. That is the question. Look at how simple that is. It's as though he's boiled down his entire dilemma into a few syllables. I'm either going to be alive or I'm not going to be alive. That's the question. And notice there's no question mark at the end of to be or not to be. Question here is more like the matter for debate. Am I going to do this or am I going to do that? And in this next little chunk, he's going to essentially restate that to be or not to be. Say what each of them means. He's going to say, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. So it's the same construction, either this or that. On the to be side, you have to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Suffer doesn't have the same meaning that we use. Here it means to endure, to put up with for years on end. The slings and arrows. And the sling is like the weapon from David and Goliath. You put like a stone in it and swing it around and throw it at someone. Sling can either refer to the weapon itself or it can refer to the projectile, the stone that you put in it. Which kind of makes more sense here because the other thing you're suffering is arrows. And he brings up that figure of fortune again. Remember that strumpet, the one who's always doing everybody wrong? And outrageous here means offensive, but it can also mean sort of hostile or capricious, just like doing whatever it wants, attacking constantly. So imagine somebody just sort of standing there and fortune is throwing stones and arrows at them. And that's the equivalent of to be. So what's the equivalent of not to be? To take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. So to take arms means to take up your weapon. So instead of standing there and having weapons shot at you, you're the one who takes up the weapons and you go out to fight against troubles. And not just some troubles, a sea of troubles, the biggest possible number of troubles. And by opposing, by standing up against them, end them. And I feel like this correspondence has confused a lot of people. Why is standing there and taking it to be? And why is going on the attack not to be? Well, I think it's because if Hamlet doesn't act, if he just stands there and takes it, he gets to stay alive. If he sees an injustice in the world, like what happened to his father, and he puts up with it, he can keep living, and then when his uncle dies, he'll be the king. He'll have to basically sell his soul to do that, but he'll live. And then if Hamlet actually takes the initiative to strike out against his uncle, he's going to die. And not only is he going to die, he's going to go to hell. This is what happens when you kill somebody, especially the king, which is treason. You're put to death, and since you're a murderer, you're probably going to hell. Especially if you kill the wrong guy, my god. People are always asking why Hamlet delays, why he doesn't just kill Claudius. Well, the first question I'd ask them is, could you go up to somebody who killed your dad and kill him? Could you shoot him in the head in public? Would there be no consequences to that, either to your soul or to your general well-being? Have any of you ever killed anyone? You think it's easy? Ask someone who has sometimes, a cop or a soldier, even someone who is right about it. It's not easy. And remember, revenge in particular is illegal and it's a sin. There's this wonderful short treatise that Sir Francis Bacon writes a few years after Hamlet. Sir Francis Bacon, another guy who didn't write Shakespeare's plays, where he calls revenge wild justice, which is a great way to put it. And at this time, they were really starting to frown on acts of private revenge. Punishing people for crimes is the state's job. It's not the job of individuals. Otherwise, you have a totally lawless society where people are just revenging forever. There's a wonderful play written a few years after this, probably by a guy named Thomas Middleton, called The Revenger's Tragedy, which is almost like a Hamlet parody, where the guy actually goes out and gets his revenge about halfway through the play, about here in the play. And then it starts to spin wildly out of control. He starts killing people he didn't mean to kill. And finally, at the end of the play, he gets arrested and taken off to be executed, because that's what happens when you run around revenging. And to be honest, Hamlet just isn't that guy. Claudius is that guy. Claudius is the one who'll kill anybody to get what he wants. Hamlet at this point in the play is not a killer. I think that's also a clue to the madness plot. On the one hand, it's a stalling mechanism while he figures out what to do about Claudius. And on the other hand, it's the only tool he has with which he can beat Claudius and all the people around him. All these seemers, the people of surfaces, the people who are constantly plotting and trying to trick each other and suck up to each other and fool each other. And if Hamlet is trying to be, to be authentic, to keep his soul intact and also be a good son, all he can do is throw off their plans by undermining them. They don't know what to do with insanity. 
I think people think that because Hamlet dresses in black and has a dead father and is out for revenge and does a lot of brooding that he's Batman. I hate to break this to you, but the character you're looking for is the Joker. The only way Hamlet wins this is to introduce chaos into these people who think they know better. That's what can get them to make mistakes. That's what he's trying to do with Claudius. He's trying to get Claudius to confess so he doesn't actually have to kill him, I think anyway. So on the day when he may finally have to act, Hamlet isn't here to think about suicide because that'll send him to hell just as easily. He's here to lay out his options. He's either going to have to make a conscious decision to not act and he's going to live, or he's going to make a conscious decision to act and he's going to die. And that's where he is at the end of this first section. One thing to point out about these first four lines in terms of their sound, they all have feminine endings, which you may remember is that extra unstressed syllable at the end. Question, suffer, fortune, troubles. There's that little hanging off the end. It's that feeling of running off the edge of the line, like a mind just spinning. So what does it mean if Hamlet acts? He's going to die. And that's exactly where we pick up the words. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. He's got to psych himself up. Dying? That's just sleep. No more. Nothing more than that. And what's the good side of that? With that sleep, we can say that we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. And sometimes life can feel like that. Like there's constant shocks happening to you. Natural because they just happen in the course of a life. Flesh is heir to. Humans inherit just by virtue of their mortality. We go through all these terrible things. Heartache and the other thousand of them. And actually, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Actually, it sounds really good. Consummation can mean like a completion or an end. It's an end you could wish for devoutly. There's an almost religious sense to it. When you think of it as a sleep, that's not so bad. So he says it again, to die, to sleep, which is a way of summing up that previous section. No big deal. That sounds great. But as soon as he hears that, he remembers to sleep, perchance to dream. Remember how he said that he could be fine anywhere were it not that I have bad dreams? Well, this is the dreams he's talking about. Yeah, dying is just a sleep. Oh, no, wait a minute. Sleeping might mean, perchance means perhaps, it might mean a dream. And that's the problem. He says, I, there's the rub. Rub is an obstacle or an impediment. That's why it's not just easy to die. You'll be fine by acting and being killed or by suicide, whatever it is. It seems like an easy way out except for this dream. And a rub literally comes from something we've talked about before, which is this game of bowls. It's very similar to bocce. And rubs are essentially like little objects that are put in the field of play to block the ball from the course it intends on. So the ball's just rolling along fine. I'm going to die. I'm going to sleep. It'll be great. No problem. And then it hits an obstacle, the rub. And why is the dream the obstacle? For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. And you've probably heard that phrase, shuffled off this mortal coil, many times in your life as an expression for dying. I think when most people picture it, you picture someone standing on top of like a giant spring, shuffling along until they finally fall off it. Shuffled off means to shake off, almost as though you have like a coat around your shoulders or a cloak, and you just shrug your shoulders until it comes off. And coil means like turmoil or disturbance or all the bad things in life. Mortal coil is all the terrible things that mortal people have to go through. So when we've thrown off all that terrible mortal stuff, it's the dreams that must give us pause. And give us pause just means makes us hesitate, hesitate to act, basically, or hesitate to die. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. A respect is like a consideration or a factor. So like that's the factor that makes calamity, that makes disaster of so long life. And there's two possible things that could mean. So it makes a disaster of such a long life, or it makes the disaster itself live so long. I also really love that last phrase, so long life. Those long sounds, they're all stressed. You really get a sense for how long life is. So that's why we put up with all the terrible stuff that happens over the course of a long life instead of just dying instantly. And this, by the way, is Hamlet spelling out in language why he's delaying. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? Who would bear? Who would endure or put up with the whips and scorns of time? Scorns are insults. But again, this is like those arrows and slings he was talking about earlier. They're physical objects, the whips, the sort of punishments of time. This can either be passing time or like our time, the arrow we live in. So who would put up with that? The oppressor's wrong. In other words, the way in which people who oppress you wrong you. The proud man's contumely. Contumely is like insulting behavior. So someone who's too proud of themselves is always looking down on you. The pangs of despised love. I think we know what despised means. It means like rejected. Sometimes you'll see other texts use despised, which means unvalued love. But either way, it's the idea that the person you love doesn't love you back. 
and you have pangs because of that. The law's delay, well, that's exactly his problem. In other words, the delay of the law in carrying out justice. If the law was prompt, then he wouldn't have to kill Claudius. The insolence of office. Office here is like officials, almost like politicians. The insolent way they treat you. And the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. Spurns are like rejections, but they're literally kicks. And merit is a person who merits something, a deserving person, in other words. So you're patient and meritorious, and you're taking these kicks of the unworthy from unworthy people. So basically, this is about the way in which the bad people always seem to beat out the good ones. So who would put up with all that crap when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? And this is where we run into all the trouble. This is the only possible reference to suicide in this speech. And quietus is a Latin term. It's a legal term. Really, it's an accounting term. And what it means is to settle up an account. Remember how the ghost talks about not having his reckoning? This is like when all the debts and outstanding payments are settled. And it's come to be a metaphor for death, and mostly because of this speech, also for suicide. A bare bodkin, in addition to having those cool B sounds, just means a dagger that's out of its sheath. So I will admit, this could refer to suicide. Who would put up with all the crappy things that come in life when you could just end it at any time? Yourself, with a dagger to the chest. But you could also think about revenge as a sort of settling up of accounts. Right now, Claudius owes him a death, his father's death. He needs to settle that up. So one way you could talk about making a quietus is by paying someone back for the wrong they did you. And you can kill another guy with a bear body can too. It doesn't just have to be yourself. So this could mean who would put up with all these terrible things when you could just take a dagger and make it all better yourself by killing your enemies. Now, of course, the result of that is that you would then be executed. But even if it's the suicide answer, which is totally valid here, that does not make this a speech about suicide. In no way does it make it a speech about suicide. This is a speech about whether to act or not by a guy who is in the throes of thinking about whether to act or not. Why would he go back to being suicidal here? And he continues, Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will? and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. So this is a long speech, but let's take all its little clauses apart. So who would these fardels bear? Fardels is a great word to say. It just means burdens. And you can really see that from that next line, to grunt and sweat under a weary life. Grunt and sweat really gives you that sense of somebody trudging along under these burdens that they're carrying. But that, if it wasn't for the fact that the dread of something after death, and notice, by the way, the echo of that word bear, bear bodkin and fardels bear. It's two different spellings and meanings, but it's a nice echo. So who would put up with these burdens? But that the dread of something after death, if it wasn't for the fact that the dread being scared of something after death, and notice those hard D sounds too, which really ram it home. And then he has this parenthetical describing what the after death part is, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. And remember, this is a super famous image, but no one had tried it out before this guy. The idea of thinking about the afterlife as an undiscovered country, especially in the time in history when people were going out on ships and finding undiscovered countries, is really original and cool. Give the guy a little credit. It's almost thinking about America as the afterlife, which ought to tell you something about America. So it's the undiscovered country from whose born, from whose frontier or border, no traveler returns. So you can go out and find it, but you can never come back from it, with the possible exception of that ghost, but who knows. So it's the dread of something after death that puzzles the will. And puzzles isn't like when a dog turns its head sideways. It's like paralyzes the will. That stops you from acting and dying. And it makes us rather bear those ills we have. There's that word bear again from the beginning of the sentence coming back. So we bear those ills. We put up with those evils we have instead of flying off to others that we know not of. Instead of running off to other ills that we don't know about. It's the devil you know versus the devil you don't. I know that life on earth is bad and miserable and a chain of sorrows. I don't know what the afterlife is like. I'll take my chances here. That's why we don't act. And he concludes, Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly door with the pale cast of thought. So I like those strong, hard C sounds in conscience and cowards. There he is beating himself up again. So conscience is like the little voice in his head telling him not to act because who knows what will happen after you act. So that's why we're all cowards. And thus the native hue of resolution. Native hue is like the natural healthy color of resolving to do something. Is sicklied o'er. That's a beautiful created word. Someone can be sickly, but in this case, it means covered over with a sickly color. With the pale cast of thought. Cast is like a tinge or a shade. So the opposite of resolution to do something is thought. 
And this is another antithesis. You have the native hue of resolution, this beautiful, strong color versus the pale cast of thought, the sickly grossness of thinking too much. And enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. I think we've seen the word pith before. It essentially means the central most important thing. So these really important enterprises. Other texts sometimes use the word pitch. They put a C in there, which can mean like high aspiration. And moment can mean importance or consequence. It's sort of that same idea as momentum or momentous. So these really great important enterprises, like for example, revenging your father, with this regard, with this consideration of the afterlife, their currents turn awry. Awry means to sort of one side or the other. So you have this current that's rushing straight towards its goal. It's a really worthy enterprise. And then as soon as you think, its currents turn awry, almost like a river diverting to one side and lose the name of action. So these enterprises that were really going off to do their thing, they just sag and lose all their air and they're no longer active. They're passive. They just sit there and take the slings and arrows. Does this sound like a guy who's ready to kill his uncle in the next scene? I think he's still incredibly torn, not about whether his uncle deserves to die, but about whether he's a killer and whether he can actually go through with it, whether he's willing to put his soul on the line because of this thing a ghost told him.